Welcome everybody to our European Studies Center Tuesday seminar, which this week is on democracy in Europe. What if Hungary's election is not free and fair? Hungary, as many of you know, has a parliamentary election on April the 3rd. For the first time in a long time, Viktor Orban faces a united opposition of six parties as candidate Peter Markizoy, which is in with a chance of defeating him. As many of you will also know, Hungary is the EU member state where the erosion of liberal democracy has gone farthest, such that even in the 2018 election, there were very serious questions raised by OSC and other monitors about whether it was certainly a fair election and indeed even a free one. To discuss the question, what if Hungary's election is not free and fair and its implications for democracy in the EU and Europe as a whole, we have an excellent panel. I will introduce them very briefly. Professor Kim Lane Skepele is the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Sociology and International Affairs in the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs and the University Center for Human Values at Princeton. Um, but most importantly, she is one of the most prominent writers on precisely these questions in relation to Hungary and has been doing pioneering and incisive work on it, which has earned her the complimentary displeasure, I would say, of, of, of Fides. Um, uh, Marta Padovi is co-chair of the Hungarian Helsinki Commission and uh, co committee, and I think, Marta, you're actually sitting in Budapest, right? So you're with us from Budapest. She was previously a policy leader fellow at the EUI School of Transnational Governance. Um, she's worked precisely on these areas of threats to rule of law and civil society in the EU, and she's been awarded the 2018 William D. Zabel Human Rights Award from Human Rights First and several other distinguished awards. Delighted to have you with us. And last but not least, our colleague, um, Dr. Marcin Walewski, who is currently director of the European and European Fellow here at St. Anthony's College. He's a former Max Weber Fellow at the EUI in Florence, and most relevantly has 25 years of experience working on issues of uh, democracy support and uh, governance. Um, notably as the head of the democratization department of the Office for Demo Democratic Institutions and Hum Human Rights, which is the OSCE body responsible for these issues. So we have a great panel. We're going to go in the order in which I've introduced. Each speaker will start with 10 minutes, and then we'll have a little conversation amongst ourselves. If you already have questions or know you want to ask a question, you're welcome to put it in the Q&A thread, not the chat, please, the Q&A thread, and I'll either unmute you or, 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 or read out the question. Kim, over to you. Yes, thank you. So delighted to be here and delighted to be talking about this subject. Um, before we go into the weeds on the Hungarian election and the Hungarian election system, let me just say something about why this matters for Europe. So everyone in the European Studies Seminar will recall all of the debates about democracy deficit. And those debates were answered in two ways, right? One was by expanding the powers of the European Parliament. And the other was by doubling down on the thought that all of the other institutions of the EU were built on the foundations of member state democracy. And so you see it in the treaties in Article 2, which prominently lists democracy as one of the foundational values. But you also see it in Article 10 TEU, which says, Article 10.1, the functioning of the union shall be founded on representative democracy. And one of the things that means is that if a member state ceases to be a democracy, its representation in the council, also its representation on the commission are contaminated in a way by its non-democracy. So it matters for everybody in the EU, whether all of the member states are still democracies. And as many of you know, the Varieties of Democracy Project has now labeled Hungary a hybrid state. So it is no longer, according to the democracy raters, really not even just a flawed democracy, but really a non-democracy. That's part one. Part two is that you, you probably saw last week that the European Court of Justice came down with a couple of very important rulings on the so-called conditionality regulation that the institutions have passed that make um, the continued supply of money from the European budget 
conditional on whether a country still observes the rule of law. Now, the rule of law discussion kind of looks like a sideshow to the democracy discussion, but in fact, they're joined at the hip, you know, both because rule of law and democracy are listed as values together in Article 2, but also because when you read the conditionality regulation, you'll see that fair, transparent, and representative democratic process is one of the elements of rule of law. So when the court last week upheld the rule of law conditionality regulation, it was also implicitly saying that the EU institutions could look at the proper democratic functioning of institutions inside the member state as a criterion for giving money. Okay, so that connects what we're about to talk about to EU in general. Let me say something just about Hungary for those of you who don't know it very well. The first thing to say about Hungary is that it's a unicameral parliamentary system, which is to say there's one election for parliament. And then of course the parliament elects the prime minister. The parliament also elects the president. The par parliament also elects many of the other um, so-called independent bodies, including the presidents of uh, the Supreme Court and, and the constitutional court judges and so on. So this is the one election that really matters. Now, the way the election is set up is that every voter gets two votes. It's like the German system where you go to the polls and you have a single vote for your constituency representative, and then you have another vote for a party list. Um, and so these two votes um, are a little manipulable, as I'll explain, um, but that's, that's sort of how the thing is set up. Um, the logic, when the election law was first written in 1990, the worry was that, as there were in many East European countries, that there would be a million tiny parties and it would be very difficult to govern. So the original election law, going back to 1990, was, was written in such a way that it sort of put its thumb on the plurality party to help it build a majority because the worry was unstable governments. Well, it turns out that worry was misplaced in the case of Hungary. Hungary very quickly settled into a six party system in the nineties and kind of devolved into a two party block rotation pattern by the following decade. So that by the time of the 2020 election, which was when Viktor Orban came to power, there were really only four parties or like two and a half, two and two halves parties on the ballot. There were the socialists who had just crashed the economy, brought in an IMF austerity program and they were obviously going to lose. There was um, a little tiny party called Lehet Masha Politica, which means politics can be different, which was youthful, vague, vague. <laughs> Nobody quite knew what it stood for. There was a sort of neo-Nazi party called Jobbik, and then there was Fidesz. So many of us were relieved in 2010, if you knew the socialists weren't gonna win, that it was Fidesz instead of the neo-Nazis, right? And in that competition, Viktor Orban won fair to square, 52% of the votes, and got two thirds of the seats in the parliament. So this is my last thing before I go into the weeds on the details of the Hungarian election law for two minutes. If you have a two thirds majority in a unicameral parliament, you have the power to amend the constitution because all it takes is a single two thirds vote. And so since 2010, 12 years now, Orban has had almost continuously two thirds in the parliament. And so he can wake up in the morning and say, the constitution's inconvenient. I'd like it changed by tomorrow. And legally it can happen. So this parliament has now in, you know, uh, basically created a kind of legal prison not only through drafting a wholly new constitution, but through a whole bunch of other laws um, that can only be changed by a subsequent two thirds majority. So this has been the lock. Okay, so now one aspect of that lock is the election system itself, okay? And this is where Orban basically rigs the elections by law. So the, one of the first things he did in 2010 was to um, amend the constitution. <laughs> to reduce the size of the, cut the size of the parliament in half. So it used to be 430 some, and now it's 199. And many people can, thought that's great because the parliament was very big and very expensive. And, and there wasn't much objection to that. But what the cutting of parliamentary seats did was it enabled Orban to redraw all the electoral districts at once, <laughs> gerrymandering. And what's happened because he was very precise in the way he drew the boundaries. And by the way, the boundaries are set like the literal street name, like go up to the corner and turn right, that level of detail. 
is in a law that can only be changed by two thirds. So even if an opposition wins an election, they can't change the districts. And those districts have produced almost a sweep of all the districts for Orban with the handful of just a, you know, a few districts in Budapest, maybe Seged, but he's won with you know, less than 50% of the vote that he's gotten since, 90% of the seats in this. So that's gerrymandering. Um, there was also um, one thing Orban also did was to change the electorate. So the Orban government gave citizenship to Hungarians over the borders who had never lived in Hungary. And those voters get to vote in elections. Now, this is where I know Ukraine is on a lot of our minds, right? So it turns out that Hungary has, the Hungarian government has gone around and gathered up voters from all the neighboring states, including Ukraine, Ukraine and Slovakia, where dual citizenship is illegal. So because of that, the government then says, well, we can't publish the list of our over the borders voters because it would put them at risk in their countries. So there are up to a million voters, we don't know exactly how many will actually vote, who are not on any list the opposition can check. And in the last two elections in 2014 and 18, the one and a half to two seats that that over the border vote generates has been the difference between Orban's two third majority and not having a two third majority. So they've been parachuting in sort of how many votes they need to get to the two thirds from this uncheckable list. Um, also, at the same time, they made it harder <laughs> if you have lived in Hungary, but now you're living in the UK, for example, they've made it more difficult for you to vote because the Hungarians um, who, are, who have a residence still in Hungary can vote in the single member constituencies and party list. By the way, I should say that the over the, voters, the, over the borders voters only get to vote for party lists because they don't have a district. The Hungarians who have districts have to go to an embassy or consulate to vote. And in the UK, uh, before the 2014 election, they closed the consulate in Edinburgh. So all the Hungarians in the UK had to go to London. And then they sent out a notice giving the wrong address <laughs> for everyone to go to. So the government has made it very hard for the over the border, for the Hungarian citizens who have been displaced, many of whom have, who have left because of Orban. So they kind of guess how they'd vote. Those people find it very, very difficult to vote. Um, the campaign finance system, which Orban has created, makes it profitable to run fake parties. <laughs> and so what we're seeing now, that the united opposition is trying to win against Orban, because again, in the single, you know, it's a first past the post constituency election, which like the UK, you don't need a majority to win, right? And so the more parties divide the votes, the more the single plurality candidate can win. And now there are all these fake parties pouring into the election this time as there were in prior times. Um, and there's another connection between these two votes, which is parties must run a certain number of candidates in the individual constituencies to be eligible for the to run a party list. And that's guaranteed that Fidesz wins these constituencies because all these parties to get their list have to compete against each other in the constituencies. That's what was so remarkable about this year because six opposition parties gave up their ability to have party lists in order to combine to run single candidates in the constituencies. But that is now being threatened because they increase the number of candidates you have to run in the single member districts. And that's, that's forced a couple of the spoiler parties that didn't join the coalition to start putting candidates into more and more competitive districts to siphon off the votes. They're more in the weeds issues for those of you who know these kinds of election systems. There's a system of transferring lost votes votes that didn't succeed in electing a representative in the constituencies over to the party list. They changed how they did that so that somehow Fidesz gets a lot more votes in that process. But the crucial thing to say is that this isn't the kind of election where people stuff ballot boxes on the day. This is an election where the rules were very specifically tailored in that particular political context to always hand these two thirds majorities to Fidesz even though in every election since 2010, Fidesz has gotten a smaller and smaller percentage of the domestic vote. So that's my lesson. This is rigged by law and we're going into a new election. And the question is whether the opposition can beat the rigged system. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Kim. That was excellent, extremely clear. I, I want to add that Fidesz has a number of very clever EU trained lawyers 
who find every possible way of working around EU law. Marta. Thank you very much and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be in this extremely um, excellent panel with my panelists. And it's a pleasure to also address this audience and the panel from Budapest, where I'm working at the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, a human rights organization. Normally in an EU member state, I think for quite a while, you didn't have human rights organizations focusing on elections. And that in hindsight, is a, a big fault, something to be corrected. Um, the Helsinki Committee, of course, takes the name from the Helsinki Final Act and the Helsinki Movement, which uh, was very much focused on free and fair elections. And I see many human rights organizations around Europe doing wonderful work. And I think this time around, it's partly or perhaps the Hungarian elections that brings back election standards, um, pluralism, free and fair voting, and election observation on the agenda of many human rights defenders. This is something that now I think preoccupies quite a lot of people and events like this underscore that important point. So I'm thankful for the opportunity. Uh, Kim went through a lot of the threats to election integrity that um, many civil society organizations have also been highlighting. And I have, and I'm just going to push the send button right now. I've included in the chat two um, briefing papers that the Hungarian Helsinki Committee produced. I hope you can see them now. Um, one uh, is basically for an audience who is not familiar with the Hungarian election system. It's a baseline. Um, information notes. And the second one gives a summary of nine types of election threats that we have identified as being very serious. Kim has gone through many of them. And I would like to add on to them in my very short remarks before um, I move on to other issues that I think are also important. As you said, Kim, it's a, it's a, it's a tilted, a slanted playing field. Certainly the rules and practices are favorable to the ruling party Fides, but still it's a super close race. Um, we should look back in 2019, there were elections held in Hungary. They were mun municipal elections. Um, the rules were somewhat different, but the overall picture I think was very similar. And in a lot of towns, quite large towns in Hungary, the opposition, the united opposition candidate won. So I think it's important to note that even with this very unfair and tilted uh, landscape, it is possible to have a, not a fair race, but a race. Some of the, the um, further flaws that I think should be highlighted beyond the ones that you mentioned, Kim, you talked about the legal framework and the electoral system and voter rights and, and campaign, but I'd like to highlight a further um, peculiarity or worrisome uh, element in the present campaign. And that's the fact that there is a referendum also. Um, a referendum will be held on April 3rd, the same day as voters go and vote for members of parliament. And this referendum was initiated by the Hungarian government. And the topic and the fact that it's initiated by the government really add to the, to the list of worries. The topic of the referendum is, I would call it an extremely vile, aggressive and homophobic topic. The Hungarian government tries to make a point that it's about ch protecting children, but in fact, it's about a law that puts um, a muzzle on free speech um, and also on uh, breaches the dignity of gay people in Hungary. Similarly to, and, and I look to Marcin, um, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, but similar to what, to what we saw in 2020 in Poland, the Hungarian government has 
unleashed um, the LGBTI issue as something to polarize, to divide, to divide the electorate, and has put together a list of very flawed, quite incomprehensible questions that um, voters are asked to answer. Since it is a government-initiated referendum, there is no there is no limit on the amount of public funding that the government can spend on making its point known. And when you walk around Hungary now, um, streets are basically plastered in posters of a, of a worried mother and her little daughter um, promoting the referendum. And at the same time, because of the divisive nature of the question, the opposition parties I think have decided by and large to not really address this to escape the framing, the lenses provided by the government. And therefore there's, in terms of political parties and the opposition, there's not that much um, uh, campaigning against the referendum. It's up to civil society organizations to, to make sure that voters um, know how blatantly false the whole question is. And so civil society organizations have a much more difficult terrain and of course much less resources to get this message across. Essentially the, the, the referendum in this sense is basically a way to circumvent campaign finance laws that otherwise would limit campaign spending by political parties. And this is extremely important because it does rally and keep on their toes the Fides voter base. And that's probably extremely important because as Kim pointed out, it's very important to um, win individual constituencies. The other uh, important addition is of course the media landscape. And this is where we also go into the whole broader discussion about democracy and rule of law in Hungary, not only focusing on elections and tilted election landscapes. The media landscape compared to what we had in Hungary in 2018, I think is much worse. And Fidesz has a very well oiled, um, propaganda machinery consisting of not only the public broadcaster, but also of several hundred outlets that repeat and parrot its message. Beyond this, online, on social media, which basically consists of Facebook in Hungary, there is um, an enormous um, tsunami of spending um, by pro-government uh, outlets, influencers, private groups, basically almost as if they were political action committees, as you know them from the US, who have spent millions of euros already just on Facebook ads. So you can target quite well. Um, and uh, even without one single campaign message, these targeted political advertisements on Facebook by individuals will probably be able to really um, also rally the, the, the electorate. Now, this is a pretty dire um, uh, scenario, but at the same time, I think it's very important to note that civil society organizations are really mobilizing in, in 2022 in Hungary. And this was not always the case. And I'm very happy to see this development. Since 2018, we've learned quite a lot about um, the importance of monitoring, of reporting, of analyzing, and also advocating on election standards. But foremost, what's most important is to make sure that Hungarian voters know what's the stake, what their rights are, that they're informed, um, that they do get out the vote, and also that um, many of them will take part in um, the limited opportunities that Hungarian law allows for election observation. It's very important to, no to note that there is no independent domestic election observation opportunity in Hungary. The hung Hungarian legislation doesn't allow for this. All the more important for uh, international observers to come also from the European Union. And here, um, I'd like to, to also um, include in the chat a call that we've addressed to European Union member states who have been also requested, of course, by ODIR to second um, adequate short-term and long-term observers to the Hungary election mission. And it's very important that EU member states step up 
and deliver for democracy in the EU itself, we can't assume anymore that we have fair elections. So EU member states must find ways to, to uh, send election observers. But Hungarians are doing this for themselves too. And there's various initiatives. Some of them train volunteers to observe what's happening outside of polling stations. Other initiatives are rolling out training materials, e-learning, and also recruiting so that people would be volunteering to be part of election commissions at the local level. People who sit in the, in the polling station and count the votes. It's very, very important that they also are aware and feel confident about applying election standards. And if they see something that's not right, they speak out that they have this minuted, that they feel confident to call lawyers who will help them out. All these initiatives are really um, much beyond what we've seen in the past few years. I'm sure that other civil society um, organizations, movements in the region who will have elections soon in Slovenia, next year in Poland, are also watching Hungary with um, curious eyes and will be um, keen to, to see how civil society um, is able to uphold election standards. With this note, I will close now and I'm happy to answer questions later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. That was terrific. Several important points there. The whole question of the referendum, uh, the question whether civil society in the ground campaign can compensate for the problem of the media landscape, which I hope we can come back to. And, and of course, the question of election monitoring, which brings me quite naturally to Marcin. Martin, over to you. Thank you, Tim. And let me start by, first of all, thanking Kim, Marta, and you for actually joining, organizing it uh, together. Uh, I'm looking at the list of participants, and it's, a, it's a, such a great pleasure to see so many experts on elections democratization with us together. So many thanks to you, Tim, for, for supporting this event. Well, again, going back to the fundamental question which Kim started with, why should we care about elections? And just put two things into perspective. <clears throat> One of the fundamental aspects of being a part of the European family is that the quality of elections and pluralistic democracy are not considered the internal affair and the matters of direct and legitimate concerns to all participating states, both OEC and I would also argue EU, and they're not, again, belonging to the matter of exclusive internal affairs. This means that countries are no longer in position to invoke the non-intervention principle and avoid discussions about the elections. Something we should keep in mind, especially seeing some recent statements coming from Budapest and suggesting foreign interference in the form of election observation. Well, my remarks are not to predict the results of these upcoming elections, not speculate on potential violations, but to emphasize the right we as European citizens have to scrutinize these particular elections in Hungary and duty we have as academics and policymakers to assist each other in solving specific problems related to deterioration of electoral standards we see in Central Europe. So a few facts um, and few solutions which I'd like to propose. Um, as mentioned earlier, there's no big bang theory behind Hungarian problematic elections. And this road has been already paved with multiple steps. Uh, looking at, you know, from perspective, the Electoral Democracy Index, as mentioned by Varieties of Democracy International Idea, was failing significantly for the last decade in Hungary. Every single international organization, right, wide range of actors, national, European, um, at the international level, have expressed concerns about elections. Um, OEC has so far observed five parliamentary elections in Hungary, and I'm going to share with you a website where you can get all the reports including the latest NAM, Needs Assessment Mission, report. And, you know, those reports are publicly available. Hungarian authorities have accepted these recommendations and findings, but failed to implement key recommendations. Since 2014, OPC OSC observers noted a general deterioration of conditions for democratic elections. Um, I'm not going to quote um, findings from those main reports, just summary, in 2014, report Odia stated that the main governing party enjoyed an undue advantage because of a restrictive campaign regulations based media coverage and campaign activities that blurred the separation 
between political party and the state. Timothy already mentioned some of the statements coming from 2018, limited election observation mission. Uh, what I would like to argue, and also looking at academic research, because you know, let's not only limit ourselves to, to statements or reports coming from international organizations. And you know, if you look at the recent um, publications, Professor Isabel Mares on patronage and electoral clientism, you know, I would argue that Fidesz has managed to successfully establish and consolidated a dominant party system characterized by clientelistic and persistent illicit electoral practices. Of course, just like Marta said, opposition parties are allowed to compete, but through various forms of political corruption and constitutional quirks, their ability to run effective campaign is significantly undermined. By planning, applying gerrymandering, abuse of state resources, politically controlled media, dominant party can maintain political control without actively and directly manipulating votes or coercing the electorate. As Stephen Levitsky and Lukan Wei argue, the defining feature of such a regime deemed competitive autocratism is the systematic denial of a level playing field to democratic oppositions. And let me take a 30 seconds just to go through one example. He mentioned it briefly, misuse of state resources. If you look at the 2014 and 2018 audio reports, plenty of evidence of how it was done. In 2014, audio reported, since March 2013, over a year prior to election day, the government conducted a campaign with slogan, Hungary is performing better. But according to government officials, the cost of the campaign in 2013-14 was four and a half million euros. It then, government sold the rights to use the slogan to Fidesz for 600 euros after which the government and Fidesz ran advertisements which were strikingly similar. On 18th March 2014, the Supreme Court ruled that the government's campaign constituted political advertising and overlapped with the Fidesz campaign and content in the form. Same examples in 2018. Marta mentioned briefly the upcoming referendum. And there is a lot of evidence in the Odier Nam report from February 2022, why we should be worrying about this referendum. And let me just mention briefly, as someone who has been working on the issue of campaign finance and abuse of state resources for the last 25 years, why I find this referendum to be particularly um, worrying. First of all, it allows government without any control to spend, go over the spending limits, spend as much money as they want on this campaign, blurring the state and party resources and messaging. It allows to be outside of the proper control of a state audit office, which is not really looking into third party advertisement. And more interestingly, it will be outside a comprehensive audio observation, not scrutinized by Council of Europe Greco, and very difficult to litigate under Article 3 of Protocol one, Number 1 to the European Convention on Human Rights. So it's actually a perfect crime, no smoking gun, you know, no Hercules Poirot to investigate it. I don't expect any serious investigation into how much money was spent on this referendum. Exactly the same what we've seen in 2014 and 2018. This is one of the many examples which Kim and Marta mentioned. So, but let's briefly look at what we as an international community, academics, especially EU, can do about uh, elections in Hungary. When I was working in Brussels as a director of EPD, European Partnership for Demo uh, Democracy, 12 years ago, there were no discussions about uh, elections uh, in EU member states. The argument was we don't do it, elections, we don't defend it, we not uh, working on strengthening, definitely not fighting for it. Speaking to Radio Free Europe on February 3rd, Commissioner Vera Jourova, in all her honesty, said, but if you ask me whether there will be some action taken after the elections, if they prove to be undemocratic or unfair, I don't see any way of doing something concrete. No. Jourova rightly observed that the rules of the EU and its member states have been designed with understanding that there will always be free and fair elections. And I quote her, the organization of elections fall under the absolute competence of the member states, so we are not ready for such a situation, she said. Well, things have changed 12 years ago, no discussion whatsoever. I would argue that at least now commission and it's in its uh, statements a year ago, is acknowledging that safeguarding the European democracy requires more determined action to protect electoral processes. This means keeping elections free and fair, 
preserving open democratic debate and updating the digital safeguards. The most recent initiatives, Kim mentioned one of them, European Democracy Action Plan, taken together with the new European rule of law mechanism are small steps in the right direction, indeed. But we need definitely much stronger actions, Marta mentioned some of them, to protect European democracies, and not just in the face of external challenges, but first of all, to respond to unresolved internal problems we have with election in member states. We definitely, team needs to change our priorities. Democracy promotion is already a strong, strongly embedded in the EU external actions. It's a central pillar of our commission's work with uh, accession and neighborhood countries. For decades, the election observation was a central EU tool for supporting democratic developments in non-EU countries. We've been spending more than 300 million euros over 2014 and 2020 period for election assistance, especially for funding EU election observation missions. Interestingly, as a part of the European Democracy Action Plan, new plan, the Commission is consolidating the capacity of EU election observation missions, but in third countries and currently recruiting for its new mission in Lebanon. At the same time, the instruments to support election democratic assistance, um, election observation in EU member states are very limited and highly dependent on OECODR, which has significantly much smaller budget and its own challenges. I already mentioned a very important uh, needs assessment mission uh, and the report Odia just produced. Marta mentioned um, a request for full-fledged election uh, observation mission, 18 long-term observers, 200 short-term observers. Definitely, I echo Marta's appeal. Um, this is a very important development. Such a large-scale election observation mission is relatively new in EU member states, but there are challenges. Uh, during 2021 Bulgarian elections, the OSC mission was limited to send only a small fraction of the observers they had intended, not actually allowing for a full-fledged EOM election observation mission to carry out observation in an affecting and thorough manner. Question why? Was it just a problem of COVID or lack of funding mechanism, which would not allow EU member states to invest in a proper election observation within EU? So, I mean, one of the conclusions is definitely we need to change our priorities, how we spend money on election observation. You know, there's a huge disproportionality between how much money we spend on external election observation and domestic observation. So just to conclude, few concrete things which I believe um, okay. we should yeah. be discussing. Uh, no doubt, the EU structural funds should be used to fund civil society and build capacity to protect democratic elections, just like Martha said. I cannot believe that we are blaming NGOs, you know, to go after Soros funds, National Endowment Democracy funds, Norwegian funds, if there is no, almost very little alternative European funding available to those organizations. Secondly, bad elections will have a profound impact, a negative impact on the image uh, of the EU and its effectiveness and credibility when it comes to promoting human rights and democracy in accession and neighboring countries. Hungarian elections are happening simultaneously with Serbian elections. Um, I could give many examples of a potential political pressure which could uh, result uh, from those Hungarian elections. European Parliament had a very important resolution 12 September 2018 on the previous elections. We could wonder how EPP would now act and behave, keeping in mind changes in its composition. Visegrad Group, difficult to predict what can be done I would not expect the same level of the same isolation as Slovakia experienced under Vladimir Mečar, keeping in mind the current Hungarian presidency of Visegrad Group. Um, very interesting debates taking place in Washington with recent um, hearings on the Hill and the Summit of Democracy Hungary not being uh, invited. IRI um, is most likely, International Public Institute is most likely sending its own observation mission. Hungary is trying to get re-elected to the governing council of community of democracies. Interesting to see what happens after elections. But the final point, which Kim and Marta mentioned, strategic litigations. I, for the sake of time, I definitely don't want to go into much details, but this is something which we should be considering. You know, under Article 3 of Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights, there is possibility for strategic litigation. We've seen court paying more and more attention, Strasbourg paying more attention, 
uh, to the issue of uh, elections. Uh, many, many interesting cases uh, from Russia, Azerbaijan. Uh, definitely there's a room to expand on the EU rule of law mechanism. Recent report on Hungary 2021 mentions the issue of media pluralism, abuse of state resources, party funding. And um, Kim mentioned the recent ruling of the European Court of Justice, which I will quote on Hungary and Poland. Compliance with those values cannot be reduced to an obligation which a candidate state must meet in order to accelerate the European Union, and which it may disregard after accession. So going back to core values. So no doubt, the Hungarian parliamentary elections will indeed be among the most important stress tests for democracy and the rule of law within the European Union. We can be third time lucky, or we can prepare ourselves well and pass this test as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh